I want to, everyone to, to uh, thank uh, Dr. Gary Fogel for coming here, and we have a special benefit of having uh, uh, Craig Harwood here, too. So they're the co-authors of uh, uh, Quiet uh, Cluster Flight. So um, authors about John Montgomery, of course, our favorite uh, local aviator. Um, and what I, what I was going to mention is um, Gary's quite, I think, known by some of the members here at the, at the club uh, for being a, 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 a person at the at the uh, Torrey Pines Bowls, and he also has quite a few um, uh, uh, national uh, contest uh, uh, records, so it, including the longest um, cross-country flight, he did 39 kilometers out and back, and it was just broken just recently, I think. Um, so just a handful of records maybe you can touch on in your, in your talk. But basically, of course, we're talking about John Montgomery, and I think we got a taste of it from the movie people last week, last month. And so we thought we'd continue with that and kind of get maybe a little bit deeper with the book and some of the things. And, and Craig also added some family history because he's his great uncle was great great uncle or great uncle? great 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 uncle was John Montgomery. So we got kind of a different twist on the story. And they've been getting quite a bit of success from the book. Um, I just bought my copy, um, and they're getting awards from well Santa Clara University. He spoke at Santa Clara University and got a Book of the Quarter award. And then San Francisco Book uh, Festival, he's got, he's got an award for that, and Southern Cal Book Festival. So it's starting to get some real traction. And um, tonight we have a special offer, tonight only. <laughs> it's normally uh, $29.95, and tonight you get it uh, for $25. So um, it might be a perfect gift at our Christmas party. You can just buy it now, be ready for the gift at that Christmas party. So, you know. And buy, buy it now, reading the books to somebody. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, actually, uh, it's I actually experimented with it, and I noticed that it slips right into a, a Christmas stocking. Perfect. There you go. Good marketing, great. Right? So, uh, with that said, I, uh, Gary, let's uh, Thank you. let it go and we'll turn so. down the lights here. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be. Uh, with South Bay Science Society. I've, I've mentioned, as I mentioned before, I've been with the Torrey Pines Gulls and in San Diego for, for many years flying RC. Uh, I grew up out there. I also went to UC Santa Cruz uh, and flew a lot at Sunset and also on campus at Santa Cruz and Davenport and all the places that you're familiar with. Uh, unknown to me at the same time, Craig Harwood was there and we both went to UC Santa Cruz without knowing each other. It took us, uh, we both received a telephone call one day from Huell Hauser, who was the gentleman that used to run California's Gold. He invited us independently down to San Diego to Chula Vista to a monument to Montgomery. And Huell Hauser, with his accent, asked me to come down there and tell me tell me a little bit about this John Montgomery fella, you know, how he used to have his draw. And I didn't know that Craig was coming. I got down there and I, I had researched a little bit about gliding history in San Diego, mainly at the Torrey Pines Glider Port. I hadn't really recognized a lot of Montgomery's history. It was unknown to me, really. But Huell Hauser asked me to be on TV, so I'm not going to say no. So I went down there, and very fortunately, here's Craig Harwood, the great-grand-nephew of John Montgomery. I'm so relieved, because now hopefully Craig can take most of the, take most of the load. And at the, after that work, Craig and I sort of realized that a lot of, uh, there's a lot of mystery around John Montgomery. And we needed to really kind of correct that story. And that was 10 years ago. So we've been writing this book for or 11 years ago. We've been writing this book. It took about 10 years to get it done and get it published to do all the legwork to get this done. It's been a great pleasure to have done that with Craig uh, through the family. I want to take you back in time to that turn of the century, the last turn of the century, in the late, let's say, 1800s, around 1900, where people believed that lighter than an air aircraft were certainly possible. You could fly in a balloon, you could fly in a dirigible, but if you thought that you could fly in something that was heavier than the air, you were completely out of your mind. It's like as if we could fly to Pluto today. It's that kind of craziness. You couldn't do it. Impossible. You'd be called a crackpot. In fact, some of the leading authorities at the time were, were saying that this is not going to ever happen. Completely impossible. Joseph Lacan, one of the people that formed the Sierra Club, a flying machine is impossible in spite of the testimony of the birds. <laughs> Lord Kelvin, one of the famous physicists from England, heavier than air flying machines are impossible. He also said that radio has no future. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't either do 72 or 2.4. He didn't know, right? Um, I also want to say that California has a very uh, deep respect and love of aviation. It's been on our heritage. Also, we think mainly differently than most other people in America. We are free thinkers. And there are very few people that have put those together. Uh, Dr. Paul McCready, who is also a glider pilot, sailplane pilot, also first a 
develop a human-powered aircraft across the English Channel, solar-powered aircraft across the English Channel. He did amazing things in technology outside of just soaring. Uh, started in models. Uh, Bert Rutan, uh, also a great aviation designer, started in models. All these great aviators start with models, and then they go do fantastic things because they've, they've explored what we know about, creating things with models and trying out new things mm. and experimenting in 20 knots down at Marina because it's fun, right? It gets you excited about it. And you can learn a lot about things by doing things with models first. And then find out that maybe those things that people think are impossible maybe aren't. And one of the first people to do that, I think the first people, first person in California, first person in America to really think that way, was this gentleman, John Montgomery, who the book is about. Uh, over time, he's become forgotten to mysterious. Did he do these things? Did he fly? Did he not fly? Our book helps explain that story, and I'll talk to you about that today. I want to first talk about his parents, because his parents and his family were very important to John. They were, they were one and the same, individual and family. His parents came separately to California as a part of the gold rush. His father, Zachariah, was trained in law. He came to California specifically to make his pile of money in gold. He wanted to strike it rich and ended up in Yuba City. His mother, Ellen, also came to the gold rush, but wanted to come to uh, realizing maybe not to make money in gold, but to make money off the fellows that thought they could make money in gold. Mm -hmm. So the business <laughs> woman. And she did very well with that, and also became a landowner. Uh, they met in Yuba City, and John was born in 1858. Uh, Zachariah was a very good speaker, uh, and had uh, definitely specific views about the world. Uh, he was raised Catholic, very strong Catholic, uh, believed uh, in certain things. He represented, first of all, he represented Sutter County to the state. Remember, the state was just born in 1849, so it's a young state. And he represented Sutter County in the state assembly. He introduced a bill in 1861 to reform the public education system. At the time, public school was compulsory, and he felt that people should be able to choose what they want to do with their uh, kids' education. It shouldn't be up to the state to tell us what to do. He also favored states' rights. He didn't favor slavery, but he did favor the rights of the southern states to decide what they wanted to do for themselves. It's not the federal government's place to tell the states what to do. And he went around the Bay Area, specifically telling people about his views. He was very open to anyone that wanted to listen, would listen to Zachariah Montgomery give a, give a lecture. Very outspoken critic of the Lincoln administration right at the time of the Civil War, which made him very controversial in the Bay Area at the time. He moved to Oakland, the family moved to Oakland in 1864 from USC. And here's the family, that's John in the middle. Uh, the young model aviator to be. His interest in aviation uh, was captivated first by those, those sorts of flying tops, the kind that have a stick with a propeller on the top. You spin them with your hand and it kind of goes up into the air and comes back down. Also playing with kites uh, as a kid. But there was one event that, that really set aviation into his mind. His father, Zachariah, was good friends with a gentleman named Frederick Marriott, who also ran a newspaper, also shared some of the same views that Zachariah shared. Together, they had two newspapers in the Bay Area that they could share their views about society with society. And Frederick Marriott came to California from England. He had had experience with dirigibles with a gentleman named Stringfellow. Stringfellow is a very well good name in, in dirigible history. Frederick Marriott, though, had a, had a vision for a steam-powered dirigible, very, very large steam-powered dirigible. And he made a small-scale version of that and test flew it on July 4, 1869, at Shell Mountain Park, which was right where San Francisco International Airport is today. And as a part of that, he invited his friends to come see this and witness this flight. He invited Zachariah Montgomery and said, you might want to bring your 10-year-old son along. You might enjoy it, too. And that's the first unmanned powered aircraft to fly in America. It's credited as that by the Smithsonian. John Montgomery witnessed that, was amazed at this flying contraption so that it could go through the air. Uh, went back home, tried to build his own dirigible, tried to lift an axe with a balloon, couldn't get it to really work very well, but at least he was interested in starting to make small-scale models of these things that he had now witnessed. And he completed his schooling in the Bay Area here in 1874 at the Catholic schools in primary education. Here's a, a picture of Frederick Marriott's dirigible. This is the, the vision. This is, these are ships in the Bay. A very, very large steam-powered dirigible. And this is the small-scale version. This is the Avatar Hermes Jr., that was at, at Shell Mound Park. You can see it's pretty big scale, actually. These are people, right? But this is a model of this thing. And this actually flew. This one never flew because, unfortunately, Frederick Marriott passed away before that vision could be a reality. Actually, that would be very heavy, too, to carry all the water in the steam, but regardless. <laughs> the family grew. This is in 1874 in Oakland. This is John, the eldest son. John continued his education here in the Bay Area, studying at Santa Clara College. 
and St. Ignatius College, which is now San Francisco College. He was schooled in hard sciences and physics and math, the things that were helping to drive the economy at the time in California, physics, uh, engineering, and also astronomy. He was recognized at those schools for his talent in science and received his bachelor's degree in physics in 1879 and his master's degree in the same subject one year later. So very, very well-educated kid living in California with interest in almost everything that had to do with science and engineering, mainly fluid dynamics, mechanical engineering, and of course that aviation thing that he had just witnessed. Now his mom, Ellen, wondered what could anyone ever do with this degree in physics? How could you make money in physics? It's not very practical. And Ellen was a businesswoman, right? She wanted to actually have kids that would go make money. So on the family plot in Oakland, this is Telegraph Avenue going this way, and this is, I think, 26th Street, right, Craig, I think? If I remember correctly. Telegraph. Oh, uh, Cross Street was 26th? No, it's... I, uh, or further out. 40, 41st. 41st Street, that's absolutely right. 41st Street. They own a large family area, uh, a land on that corner, and they built a Montgomery Brothers grocery store. John, his eldest brother, Richard, uh, youngest, next, next brother, Richard, ran the store uh, selling groceries because that's what mom kind of wanted the kids to try to do. Uh, John, in fact, was more interested in doing math and science at the register than calculating how much the sale of fruit was going to be for the customer. So that, this whole experiment didn't really work very well for the family. Um, it wasn't really what John wanted to do with his life, uh, and that was pretty clear. At the same time, though, Ellen developed asthma, and as with many doctors in America at the time, when people would come to them with asthma, they would say, you should go to Southern California, you should go to San Diego, because it's got this idyllic climate, your asthma will be healed if you go to San Diego, go there for vacation, see what you think, or move there. People all around the world, all around America, would come to San Diego for that reason. Uh, and so the family, except for John and Richard, and then uh, John was left manning the store and then moved down later, moved down to Fruitland, which is a, a, a ranch that they had at Otay, California, right near the Mexican border. It's between San Diego downtown and the Mexican border, closer to the Mexican border, about a wagon's ride away from downtown San Diego. Uh, this is an ornamental pond out of concrete that John built by the time he got there uh, in the early 1880s. It's the family ranch. Now, this ranch was, was very remote at the time. There, there were neighboring ranches. Um, each ranch had its family uh, and a large collection of buildings but uh, lots of open space to do things. You can go find a field to launch model gliders with winches back then if the SBSS was around. It would be easy to do and no one would complain and no one would charge you a fee, right? You just go do it, right? It's, the world is your experimentation. And, and in this barn, uh, John convinced his parents that he should have some area to explore science. So they allowed him to have the uh, barn to do what he wanted to do. He was in, interested in looking at electricity. This is a little art for electric current. He had a gyroscope over here to test his theories about the retrograde motion of planets. Uh, one planet in particular, I cannot remember if it's Uranus or Neptune, I think it's Uranus, spins backwards to the rest, and he wondered why, and he tried to come up with theories about why that was the case. But, although he was interested in all this stuff and had this amazing sort of home laboratory to his disposal, it was what he found outside that was an amazing laboratory for him, because he would find very, very large flocks of American pelicans that would come in the fall to the San Diego Bay <coughs> through the wintertime. Tremendously large flocks of birds circling in these currents of air without flapping their wings, and they're going up. And he's, how can that happen? They don't even need to flap their wings and they're going up. And, and he'd add up the mass of the pelicans, because there's hundreds of them up there, and he'd go, wait a second, their mass is larger than my mass. If I could just figure out how they're, what the physics is of what they're doing, that means I could maybe be supported in whatever current of lift they're in. That would be fantastic. So ornithology really captured John at a very early age on this ranch in the middle of nowhere, south of San Diego. What was he to do about it? So as most early aviators, uh, they would either uh, shoot a bird and then understand the wing and try to understand the bird's wing by tacking it onto a barn door and trying to let it dry out and understand an airfoil shape. They would try to capture birds and understand their motion, how they were actually flapping their wing to get the motion down. And from those sorts of studies, they then started developing their own ornithopters, flapping wing devices to try to flap their way to success. And John built three of these and tested them on this ranch um, in the middle of nowhere. But there were people watching. Uh, neighboring ranches were wondering, what does this Montgomery kid think he's doing by flapping his wings like a bird? He's out of his mind crazy, because society tells you that that's absolutely crackpot crazy. You can't do that stuff. 
And so the neighboring ranches were uh, direct considerable ridicule to John and his one, you know, go to his parents, well, that's, what's up with your son? You know, a little strange. Uh, and in light of all of that ridicule, and also in light of the failure of his ornithopters, which most early aviators experienced, all of them experienced the same kind of failure. They couldn't get these things to flap like birds do, and they couldn't take off. They're very, very, uh, very um, difficult. Uh, he then went to largely doing those sorts of activities in seclusion. He didn't like the ridicule. He didn't want the ridicule. He just wanted to experiment in his science. There were neighboring uh, kids on neighboring ranches that would, uh, you know, under the secrecy of uh, oath of secrecy, not to tell any parents, help him with some of these experiments. Uh, but by and large, he was going to try to do things in seclusion. And also, rather than work with flapping wing devices to try to understand the power of how a bird would lift itself up, he said, forget the power part. I want to understand the physics of flight. How can the bird wing even generate any lift? And in light of that, let's leave the engine and the motor part away of it. Let's just come up with a glider and understand the mechanics of gliding first, and we'll add the motor later once I understand how the gliding part works. So right away, he goes to model gliders. America's first model aviator, trying to do little free flight model gliders to figure out what, what's an airfoil. Why do I need an airfoil? What shape does it have to be? What's the circulation of lift around an airfoil? Trying to understand the physics of it, because he's a physicist. He was trained in fluid dynamics in water systems. I wonder if the air is a river, is a current, is like water. And can the same rules that apply to boats and other things apply to things in the air? Great physicist. So from those early free flight models, he developed his first man-carrying device, a glider. He called it the gold glider. This was built in 1883. In Craig and I did a lot of homework to figure out that it was flown in 1884, roughly March of 1884. There's no pictures of it, unfortunately. Uh, there's drawings from the period. This is a drawing that was made in 1909, uh, published in a book of that period. Uh, there's a drawing I'll show next, but I want to take you through this drawing first. So the first thing to notice is that this aircraft has a, a parabolic wing, which is a good idea. It has this pulley system here, where if you pull on this lever, you make your elevator go up or down. So we're going to control pitch with this elevator is a good idea. Uh, roll is going to be controlled by weight shifting, like a hang glider pilot would today. We're just going to hopefully shift our weight, and that's going to be enough roll control. And we're going to leave yaw completely unaddressed. Right? Just, yeah. Birds don't have a rudder. Why do I need a rudder? Right? Haven't gotten there yet. Now, we do have drawings for gliders number two and three. We don't have a, 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 we don't have a good drawing from Montgomery on glider number one. There was another drawing made in, in the present day from his drawings glider number two and three, which I'll show you in just a second, which is probably a more realistic version of what glider number one really did look like with a bigger moment between the trailing edge and the, and the elevator. Uh, center gravity way up here. Uh, but by and large, the control systems are the same. This glider flew. Uh, he flew it from the rim of Otay Mesa, which is, if you're familiar with the area near where Brownfield is today, there's an airport down there, very similar to just west of where Brownfield is. Pretty steep drop off, running up drum and flying down uh, the cliff the little hill uh, to a landing below. This flew, but the controllability of this glider was not great. Right away he's experiencing the fact that, you know, gotta come up with a better control system. But, right as he's having the success with this glider, his father, Zachariah, who again was a very well-known orator and, and lawyer, was selected by uh, U.S. President Grover Cleveland back in Washington, D.C. to become the U.S. Assistant Attorney General for America. And so the entire family, except for Richard and John, moved from Otay, California to Washington, D.C. so that the father could become the U.S. Assistant Attorney General. It was a big, big deal. And a lot of media attention was focused on the family, not like we have today, <laughs> but media attention nonetheless. And I have to believe that Zachariah probably told his son, you know, kind of calm it down on the glider activity because I can't have a son who's a crackpot when I'm going to be going to Washington, D.C. But after I'm gone, maybe you have a little bit more fun. Okay? So the whole family moved. They left John and Richard with the duty of managing this farm but then he had more room to explore with both parents away, right? which is great. So back to, back to aviation we go. They wrote letters to each other. We only have a few of the letters that have survived, unfortunately. Um, whenever John would go out experimenting, he would have to disguise his duties, right? So he doesn't want everyone to know what he's doing. He would go out uh, with a shotgun, cover the glider with the wagon, so that he'd look like he's going to go out with, with hay or, or go out and do farming duties or go out to go shoot deer or do something like that. Um, and come back late at night when no one really knows what he had done. So they wrote letters. This is a letter back from 
the father back to the son on August 6th of 1885, the whole family had taken great delight in his success as a deer hunter. And we're now waiting anxiously to hear the next result of his, or the result of his next experiment with his flying machine. So even within the family, they knew that this was happening. It wasn't public knowledge. And if you read on down here, it says the girls say they will watch for him to land on top of the Washington Monument. So even the family was like, you know, go for it, John. We know you can do this crazy stuff. You know, keep, keep at it. The family knew what was going on. The public had no idea. He went on to glider number two. This differed from glider number one in several ways. And, and I have to say, he, he was clear that he used model gliders between each of these full man-sized gliders to test different theories, especially around this problem of control. One of the bigger problems for him was, though, building a man-sized carrying glider thing was a, a, a big ordeal. And in time, of, in time of building material, building the aircraft, hauling it around, doing things at small scale was much easier. So between each of these gliders was a small scale glider uh, conquest. And then also, it's not clear if he used parts of glider number one to build number two and then build number three, which he probably did. We're not sure. But this, differed, this differed from glider number one in several very important ways. First of all, he included dihedral, which is a good idea if you're going to avoid yaw problems. He changed the wing in many ways. He changed it by adding in this, this surface on the back, this trailing edge that could move. It's a spring-loaded flap that could return to neutral, but if the roll was different or sufficient, it would hopefully right the glider to being neutral again. So it's a spring-loaded gust dampener that could also be controlled. They're like ailerons, but they're spring-loaded to be gust dampeners. Has that controllable elevator like we had in glider number one, and also we've changed the airfoil no longer using a parabola, we're using a flat plate for an airfoil. Wow. Okay. So didn't understand the importance of having a curved surface yet. Or this was a control experiment for the importance of a, of a curved surface, we're not sure. This did not fly as well as the first glider. And he changed the launch method. Instead of having to run forward with enough speed and jump off this cliff, he developed a dolly with four wheels and, and a railroad track that would go off this, off this hill, down a hill. You put the dolly at the top of the hill, you put the glider on the dolly, you hop in the glider, and then you roll off the hill with this dolly to gain enough speed to then fly off the dolly and keep going. And you have to grab all that equipment back up to the next experiment and do it again. So this glider flew. It was more controllable than glider number one, but didn't fly as far. He built the third glider. It differed again. It still had dihedral, but in this case, the wings independently rotated around a point. So it's considered like a winger on. I use slopers out there, the whole winger run. This is 1885, the guy had a winger run, it's so cool. And he had the controllable elevator. So now you're, you're doing a lot of controls as you're flying. You've got elevator, you're trying to get the other runs to, or the winger runs to do what you want them to do. A lot of stuff, right? And he also changed the airfoil again. So this one, he went back to the parabola, but now he twisted the leading edge up, and he twisted the trailing edge up. And although Craig and I have done a lot of work on trying to figure out why that is, why he did those, we're not sure at all why he did those. Could have been another control experiment for glider number one. This flew better than glider number two, not as good as glider number one. And after all of that experimentation, he realized, first of all, he understood control. He had good control systems. But he still, still really didn't understand the physics of what was happening to the flight. How did that wing actually generate the lift that I felt? So. Being a physicist, he went back to his lab. This is on his ranch in the 1880s. He built this water current tank. There's a hose that goes through here, up into this table. And the water goes around in a circle. And on this little device here, you can put a, a, a curved surface and watch the water flow over the surface and actually also measure the pressure that the water makes on your surface and measure that pressure. It's a good test if you're a physicist designed to train in fluid dynamics. This is a great system to understand the nature of lift over a curved surface. But it's in water. Maybe that's not the same as air, right? So he built a smoke chamber. This is a chamber of smoke going around in a circle. And on the top, you have a glass plate that you look through. And you can see how the smoke goes over a curved surface. What are the, what's the turbulence behind? What does the surface do to the smoke as it goes over? And from all those laboratory experiments, plus his own having flown, he started deriving his own equations for a curved surface. Where's the center of, gra where's the center of gravity? Where's the center of pressure? How does the center of pressure change with angle of attack? What's the flow around the airfoil? Is it a circulation flow? He actually came up very early with a circulation flow, far earlier than Lanchester or Prandtl, which are the two people that are believed to have been the ones who originated the circulation flow around a, around a wing. This is all in the 1880s on a ranch in the middle of nowhere, south of San Diego, on his own. 
At that same time, he was patenting other stuff. He invented a method for de-vulcanizing rubber, making rubber harder or softer. He that went all the way to patent completion in 1884. So he knew all about the invention process, how to get something all the way done to patent. He patented a petroleum burner for heating. He invented his own dynamo to make electricity. He realized, though, after he'd made that, that someone else had already patented it, so he smashed it with a hammer. He was so <laughs> irritated that he didn't, wasn't the first to get to it. Uh, again, studying astronomy, he published scientific themes in his father's magazine, Family's Defender, because his father was still defending the family's rights to publish education systems as they want to do it, or whatever education system they wanted. And he's doing farming, too. Busy guy, right? And so after Grover Cleveland's term ended, and after the family moved back to Otai, they found John and Richard to be very tired bachelors. And specifically offered John a vacation. John, where would you like to go? He said, well, I'd love to go to the World's Fair in Chicago, because I've heard that Nikola Tesla, my hero of electricity, is giving a lecture there. Can I go? And they sent him on a train from San Diego to Chicago to go to the World's Fair in 1893. A very, very large percentage of America went to this fair. It was a very big thing to do in 1893. This was the trip of a lifetime for John. And upon arrival, he found this thing called the International Congress on Aerial Navigation. He's like, oh my goodness, what's this? There's aviators. Oh my goodness, I'm not the only one. People are studying this stuff. And so he introduced himself to the leaders of this Congress, uh, people like Octave Chanute and Albert Zamm. Albert Zamm actually had to convince Octave Chanute, who was a railroad engineer at the time, to be involved with this because Octave didn't want to be involved with all these crackpots doing crazy stuff with flying machines. He wanted to only be uh, associated with the true scientists doing this art. And Samuel Langley was working at the Smithsonian at the time, also involved in the Congress. And so Montgomery introduced himself to these people and said, I'm John Montgomery, you don't know me. I've been experimenting with gliders, and I understand the physics of flight. Can I give some lectures at your congress? And they said, well, sure. And he convinced them enough that he was trained in the art, that he knew what he was doing. He gave two lectures at that conference, one on soaring flight and uh, one on uh, the mechanics of an airfoil. Uh, after those lectures, he discussed flight at length with Chanute at Chanute's mansion in Chicago. Chanute, of course, uh, knew a lot about patenting and knew about the patent office. Both of them realized that the patent office still held the belief that heavier-than-air flight was impossible. So how are you supposed to patent something that's impossible? How do you prove it? You can't take your glider to Washington, D.C. and fly it on the mall and show the patent office that it's going to work. And it's hard to do it at small scale and actually show that maybe you can get inside it and fly it. How are you going to convince these people? Eventually, though, the patent office will come to the realization that it is possible, because it is possible. And when they do, and when someone does patent the aviation, the, the heavier-than-air the heavier flying machine, they ought to make it freely available to everyone because it's man's right to fly. Everyone should be able to fly. People have wanted to fly for centuries, since Leonardo da Vinci, right? Longer than that. Chanute had a great interest in collaborating with Montgomery at that time, but unfortunately that collaboration never came. Uh, Montgomery returned to San Diego, to Otay, and took up a, a teaching position in Northern California, near Ronerville, near Alton, California at Mount St. Joseph's College, teaching physics. Uh, Chanute's wife also suffered from asthma, and Chanute's wife, doctor, also said, you should go to San Diego because it's idyllic conditions. And the family came to San Diego. Chanute came to San Diego. Uh, but unfortunately, they never had a chance to collaborate with Montgomery. In fact, on one trip, Chanute's wife and daughter came knocking on the ranch at Otay, saying, Octave Chanute would really like to collaborate with John. Can we please collaborate? And Ellen, John's mom, answered the door and said, no more glider experiments, and we're done. And John's already moved on, so no more glider experiments. So John had already moved up to Ronerville in Alton, California, which is up here, focusing on aerodynamics and physics rather than manned contraptions, and he missed that opportunity to collaborate with Chanute. Uh, he later returned to the Bay Area here to become a professor at Santa Clara College in English and Math, and then later as an assistant prof in physics. So again, returning to his alma mater. Um, uh, this is not, there we go. Um, the, fathers that were the professors at Santa Clara College were the best that the world had to offer. These were um, fathers brought to California from Italy, specifically trained in the art of science in what California would need. Geology, mechanical engineering, fluid dynamics, things that Californians needed at the time to make California grow. They had laboratories like this one at Santa Clara College, which, I mean, if you're coming from the Barn Laboratory near Montgomery, this is a, you got to Valhalla, this is great stuff. This is science heaven, right? Fantastic thing. So John immediately started 
to experiment with all sorts of other things. He started doing wireless telegraphy. This is a wireless telegraphy unit with one of the fathers. This is John on the right. Uh, he made his own gold concentrator. He patented this device to take the sands from beaches that were near the exits from rivers that had gold deposits upstream, to then take that sand, shake it through this device, and sort out the gold. For all of his efforts that he was doing at Santa Clara, Clara College, including teaching and invention, he was offered an honorary doctorate in physics in 1901. John was also a member of a very important club locally, the Sempervirians Club. Uh, Sempervirians is the genus of the redwood tree, and at this time, in the early 1900s, people in the Bay Area recognized that many of the old growth redwoods in the Santa Cruz Mountains were being logged at a tremendous rate, and something had to be done. So each university and college in the Bay Area sent one representative to the Sempervirians Club. This is David Starr Jordan from Stanford. This is John Montgomery representing Santa Clara College, and their mission was to go to Sacramento to convince the state government to set up a state park to preserve redwood trees in the Santa Cruz Mountains. There was no state park yet. This would be the first one. And through their efforts, they convinced the state to set up Big Basin State Park, which is just over the hill here, uh, to protect the redwood trees in the old growth forest. So Montgomery was a direct part of that effort. I want to take a little side trip and then come right back to Montgomery. There were other people experimenting with aviation in the Bay Area, of course, uh, mainly with balloons. There's a gentleman named Park Van Tassel and his wife, Jeanette. Uh, they would make balloon ascensions at, at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, which was called Central Park back then. And then underneath the balloon, they would work a trapeze act for paying customers. So, you know, watch the people who might fall off this trapeze wire, maybe, but I'll pay you 10 cents to watch that deal. That's kind of interesting. Um, he conceptualized the idea that maybe people would pay a little bit more money if I could jump from the trapeze with a parachute and successfully land below. I might pay another 10 cents. Uh, he convinced his assistant, Thomas Baldwin, to make the first jump. And Thomas Baldwin made the first jump in January of 1887. I want you to remember that name. He'll come back in the story just a little bit. Thomas actually didn't make the jump under Park's control. Thomas went and did it on his own without Park really even knowing he was going to go do it. He did it anyway. It was a great idea. And he went and ran with it, made money, and didn't give the money to Park. So they had a big disagreement. And out of that, also, Jeanette said, you know what? We don't need Thomas. We're going to go make our own jumps. And she made the world's first female parachute jump in Los Angeles, July 1887, using this method. <coughs> there were people also experimenting with dirigibles here in the Bay Area. This is August Grace, California Eagle. It has this big trellis underneath and this big bag uh, with the, the uh, strapping over it. If you can, the control system on this, yes, Craig, please. I uh, just want to point something out before yeah. you move on too far. Um, yeah. both Thomas Baldwin and Jeanette Van Tassel popularized that sport to the degree that uh, all of a sudden there was a whole generation of men and women uh, throughout the country partaking in this sport, and for the next 20 or so years, this is a very popular sport. And all around the world, too. I mean, yeah. Thomas traveled the world doing that, that parachute jump. Thank you. Uh, so the control system of this was crazy stuff. So you got this trellis. If you want the dirigible to go down, uh, you walk forward. If you want the dirigible to go up, you walk backwards on the trellis. It's just a CG change. You might have a rudder. That would be good. And in order to do the propulsion on this thing, you, you basically have, this is the propeller, you basically have what, are, what amounts to ceiling fans uh, taken off the ceiling, stuck on the side of your dirigible, and hopefully that's enough propulsion to get you to go forward. Uh, very, very underpowered, giant gas bags. With batteries. <laughs> no lipos. No lipo fires. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What, what gas did they use? What gas? Hydrogen or helium? Hydrogen, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Very nice and safe. Nice and safe. Yeah, don't bring the, don't bring the lipos on board. This is Thomas Baldwin on the, on the right. And August Grief hired Baldwin to be his aeronaut in this contraption. Uh, Baldwin, though, uh, again, very shrewd person, recognized that you can make a lot of money having just traveled around the world doing parachute jumps, you could make a lot of money with the rituals, taking them around the world or taking them around America, selling them as an act. But someone would really need to figure out the propulsion system better because these propulsion things don't work very well. So who around the Bay Area knows anything about aeronautics and aerodynamics? People would say, you should go talk to John Montgomery down at Santa Clara College because he knows a little bit about aviation. So together, at a wind tunnel at Santa Clara College in 1904, 1903, 1903, they worked out propeller design. And looking at different propeller shapes, uh, different pitch on the propeller, airfoil shapes on the propeller to maximize thrust as measured in the wind tunnel. 
And through all that investigation, they invented their own propeller design that would go undirigible that Thomas Baldwin would then use. But Thomas said, you know what, John, I know you like gliders. I'm, I'm into dirigibles and balloons. You like gliders, that's fine. What if you took a balloon and you lifted the glider up with it? And then at a very high altitude, you released the glider and it could come back down again. People would pay a lot of money to see that, if you could make that happen. He said, great stuff, Thomas, this is great. Let's sign a contract. You build the balloons, I'll build the gliders. We'll go out around America and we'll make a lot of money. Great stuff. Very first aero time. First, first aero time of a balloon, yeah, wow. Uh, yes. Um, uh, yes. This was the first time that Montgomery had realized he could actually make money in the thing he loved the most, which was aviation. To this point, he had never made money in aviation, so it was his first time, right? And right after this, Baldwin went to Los Angeles, built his own dirigible called the California Arrow, uh, stuck Montgomery's propeller on the California Arrow, and went to St. Louis, to the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904, uh, hired Roy Nabishu as a pilot, and together they set the longest distance for a dirigible flight at the St. Louis Fair and won a $100,000 prize. It's not clear that they collected that prize because from our research it may seem that the prize, the organizers didn't have $100,000 to give. Because um, it's a lot of money in 1904, wow. Um, but Montgomery read about this here in the papers and wondered, what is Baldwin doing? He's supposed to be building balloons for me for my glider thing. He's, what's he doing out in St. Louis? And he's using the propeller that I helped him design and I didn't get anything. I don't need credit for that. That's not fair. And so they had a big exchange in the newspapers here in the Bay Area. Baldwin, Bal uh, Montgomery ended up suing Baldwin for contract infringement. Baldwin countersued for libel. They had a big court case going on. And Montgomery said, you know what? I don't need Baldwin. I'll make my, I'll hire my, I'll get my own balloons, I'll build my own gliders, I'll get in the glider, I'll get someone to be in the glider, we'll do it ourselves, we don't need the guy. And so that forced him to go back to what he loved best, which was model gliders, just get started with, to come up with a new glider design that could handle going up to high altitudes, carrying a man aloft, and handle the stress of that, of that balloon launch. Specifically, he uh, went back to what he was doing in the 1880s, but changed the wing area, doubled the wing area effectively, uh, and also added in a very, very large vein-like fin in the rear of the aircraft. Uh, specifically, though, as a physicist, he wanted to find what he called equilibrium in flight. If you launch the glider on a downward angle from the balloon, will it right itself and continue flying on in a straight-level fashion? Even if I launched it upside down, would it still right itself and continue on in a level fashion? It might do a little bit of a fugoid, but would that, fugue, would that oscillation dampen out and keep going? Uh, in a level flight afterwards. If you could do that, you've solved the physics of the system, you know how you can find an equilibrium condition for that system. And that's what he was really interested in as a physicist. So he made model gliders. These were fairly large size free flight model gliders at the time. This is the first one, the Pink Maiden. Again, very similar to his 1880s designs. If you look here, this, if I just ask you to remove this back wing, this rear wing in your mind, it looks very similar to the ones he was constructing in the 1880s where he had a wing up front, big distance, and then the elevator. He's, added, he's doubled the wing area, right, in a tandem wing configuration, pilot sits, sits in between. Um, he's got a very, very large vein-like fin to control yaw. He's using elevator to control pitch. And in this situation, he's going to try to invent a, a, a warping system can, to control roll. So both of these wings are going to warp or twist for roll. Um, this glider flew well as a free flight model. This is his mom, Ellen, with the model, the Pink Maiden. Uh, unfortunately, it was damaged in the earthquake in 1906, uh, but this is the actual model. There was a movie made about John Montgomery, maybe you heard about it last month, called Gallant Journey, and this is the model, free flight model glider that was used, in, or one of them that was used in the movie. Uh, here's Glenn Ford playing the role of Montgomery with one of the model gliders, building them in the, in the laboratory setting at Santa Clara College. Um, he built another glider. This is the Buzzard, five foot wingspan free flight model glider. Uh, here we've incorporated the rudder into the rear wing, rather than having it be separate. Did not fly as well as the first one. And he made a, an unnamed seven foot free flight model, pretty big for free flight. Uh, this is a, a different configuration now, we've got an airfoil shape back here as a, as a second wing, but it's smaller than the front one, and the rear uh, fin is incorporated in that rear wing. And I'll ask you to sort of remember this picture in your mind, because that will come back in the story later on. From those three model gliders, the first one flew the best, and he then decided to make a very large, real-sized, uh, one-to-one-sized version of that, of that model, and flew it as a kite first, and then also as a free-flight glider in, the, in a real setting, uh, launching it from a trestle that's down uh, near Manresa Beach, near Aptos, which is still 
the trestle's still there today, you can go, go down there and see it. Uh, and also launching this by balloon from different orientations to make sure it could land in, in an equilibrium, or right itself in equilibrium uh, without any on board. This is unmanned. Uh, these, again, these were done at the Leonard's Ranch, at Leonard Ranch in Aptos, California. You can see the, the stringers coming down here uh, testing the control systems or tethering it to the ground to test where the center of gravity might be. But these, these flights worked well. Uh, here's a landing on the beach. Someone very happy, one of the uh, helpers, uh, very happy. Then the problem was how do you control that thing? And back at campus at Santa Clara College, which is pictured here, he made a bamboo mock-up of the glider. This is all out of bamboo to figure out the control systems, particularly for the warping. So this is this bar down here that you, man you manually press down on with your, with your feet. And if you press down here, you're going to pull down the right wing. So pushing down on the right warps down the right wing, which makes you turn to the left. And if you push down to the left, warps down the left wing, which makes you turn to the right. Mm -hmm. So the whole wing is going to rotate. I should say that this is after the Wright brothers had flown in Kitty Hawk. And news of that really didn't make it to California uh, at all. John was unaware of that at the time. The Wright brothers were quite private about that. They had one thing in the newspaper, and then they were kind of hush-hush about it, because they were interested in patenting that design. Uh, so they didn't specifically go public with it for quite some time. Montgomery realized that uh, he hadn't flown very high off the ground before, and hadn't had that kind of experience, and needed someone who could fly very high off the ground, because he's going to be lifted aloft in a balloon, and find someone who had familiarity with balloons and working underneath them. He sought out a gentleman named Daniel Maloney here in the Bay Area, who had won a lot of medals for his trapeze work under balloons, and trained him as his first aeronaut for this new contraption. That Montgomery airplane, this tandem wing glider, was finalized in early 1905, was test flown by Montgomery on the hillsides near Hollister at San Juan Bautista on short little glides to make sure that the control system worked before they were going to put Daniel Maloney in it and go up on a balloon. And then through a series of flights in March of 1905 at Aptos, Daniel Maloney was launched by balloon to high altitudes, released from those altitudes and glided back down to a prescribed location for a controlled landing. At each of those flights, Montgomery would make the controls a little bit greater on each flight. So at the, the first flight, there's not much movement in the control system at all. I use a stick because I'm used to flying with a sailplane. But, you know, the control system's like this, right? And my pedals. Uh, those control systems were, were tight. But over time, they were less and loosened so that Daniel had more control over the roll and the pitch. Yaw again was addressed by that fin like rudder. Um, so Montgomery, through these experiments, had realized that he actually made something that worked. It worked very well. You could launch it at very, very high altitudes. These were the first high altitude flights by man in the world. No one had ever flown to these altitudes. So it's time to show the public what they had done. I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on with the uh, clicker. There we are. This is a picture of the glider at Lands Ranch. It's, I think, the only photo we know of it, right, Craig? I mean, there's only this photo yeah. in that time period. You can see how, how, ro how rotatable these wings are. You can see the amount of droop that are in them in the uh, wash-in configuration. This is without the control system working. Very flexible wing, except for the center section, which looks like it's very, very strong. Okay, so he returned to Santa Clara College on April 29th to show the world, show the public, and show the fathers at Santa Clara that he actually had solved flight. Um, and on that date, he, uh, uh, Daniel Maloney went up in the glider with a balloon, went up to a very high altitude, at as high as the surrounding mountainsides. So when you're the same height as Mount, ben, Mount Madonna, it's time to release. Pretty high up, right? And then over a period of about 15 minutes, glide back down in a controlled fashion to a landing where I tell you to land, and he landed at exactly that location. This was widely advertised in the Bay Area as, you know, Katrina's achievement, come see the Montgomery Glider. It's the first public flight anywhere in America. This predates Glenn Curtis's flight in the June Bug, which was in 1908 which is commonly thought of as the first public flight in America. Certainly that was the first public powered flight in America. This is the first glider flight in America that was public. They had christened it the Santa Clara after Santa Clara College. And news of this went all around the world, to Le Monde newspaper in Paris, to the Chicago Tribune, to LA Times, to everywhere, New York Times. Word got back to Octave Chanute. Octave Chanute wrote to Montgomery, hey, send me particulars about your design. I'm very interested in what your glider looks like. Montgomery sent him a photo in the letter saying, this is what we're doing, it's fantastic stuff, it works great. And that same afternoon, as Chanute got the letter, he sent the letter and the photo to the Wright brothers. Okay. Without telling Montgomery, he was immediately sending the information to the Wright brothers. 
It's not clear if the Wright brothers ever used that information in their designs, but it is clear that the information of the Wright brothers was never coming back through Chanute to Montgomery. It was a one-way street. And Chanute at that time was sort of like the Wikipedia of information. It was an open source database of information on aviation. People were asking Chanute for all the information on aviation. And if you go to the Library of Congress, as I've done, he's got volumes and volumes and volumes of letters that he's written all around the world to aviators, collecting all the information that people were doing and uh, for, uh, sending a lot of that to the Wright brothers at the time of their invention. Here's the pictures of that day here at Santa Clara College. So this is Montgomery getting the glider together, prepping it for launch. Uh, standing very proudly by the fire. This is Daniel Maloney in the cockpit. Again, the cockpit's just a two by four. Uh, better make a good landing. Uh, this is John on the right. This is a great picture. I, I love this picture because this is, this is Ellen Montgomery's mom. And he specifically invited his mom to come see because he said, this is an opportunity not afforded many mothers. It's the first public flight by man. Mom, it's going to work. I told you it's going to work. It's going to work. I'm going to show you, you know? So mom came to see it work. And here's another picture right before the launch. And you can see how much this wing can rotate. This is you know, a lot of wash out, a lot of wash in, a lot of wash out over here as it's on the ground. So very rotatable wing. And two very strong cabanes holding that whole struts together with, with wires. This is the balloon getting ready. This is, you, you get a lot of your friends around here to hold it over an open fire, heat up this air. And that's the size of the balloon. Here's the tail of the aircraft. It's a pretty big balloon. And it was advertised as the most daring feat ever accomplished by man. This is, you know, wow, come see this amazing miracle of flight for the first time. Here it is going up in a balloon. Uh, yeah, this is a, I was very fortunate to have found this picture on eBay uh, during our time we were researching the book. And this, this, this photo, along with an album that I purchased for cheap, uh, is now at Santa Clara College in the Archives. If you, if you look carefully, you can see the stress that's being put on this wing as it's going up. There's a lot of downforce on both wings. So you can see that that's what's happening. And then after the release, it's gliding back down. And this is the tail where he landed. You can see the crowd gathering around him uh, after the controlled flight. He landed right where Montgomery said he should. There's a nice replica of that in the Hiller Museum up in the, near Palo Alto. Uh, if you have a chance to go to that museum, it's fantastic. Uh, they did flights not only at Santa Clara, but they went around the Bay Area demonstrating this technology for paying customers. Uh, this was a flight in San Jose on May 20th, May 21st. You see the balloon getting assembled here, and then this is the you know, one going up with the balloon. Here's another picture. Here's John Montgomery in the corner operating the, the windlass that's going to go to a pulley that lifts the glider up and the balloon up at a constant rate rather than just going off the ground, which might break the machine. Um, so that's kind of like the first winch operator, you know? Right? Uh, uh, and then in the corner here, you can see that there's another glider that's just a duplicate of this one. It's called the California. So he was making a series of these gliders now because they work so well. They made a whole series of flights. Some flights worked better than others. Sometimes the glider had a difficulty releasing from the balloon, so they would have to go land together. And paying customers were not so happy with that one. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they would release too early. You know, it goes up maybe 400 feet, and then it releases, and he comes down in a hurry and lands and paying customers. You were going to go to 2,000 feet. I, I want my money back. So they had some difficulty with the balloon launch method. Unfortunately, on one flight, July 18th, at Santa Clara College, uh, one of the ropes from the balloon uh, hit the rear cabane of the, on the rear wing, hit the cabane on the rear wing and knocked it loose, uh, broke it. Either Daniel Maloney didn't know that or didn't care about that and felt like the machine could stay together after he released. But uh, unfortunately for Daniel Maloney, when he released, the force on that rear wing made it collapse and that sent the machine plummeting to the ground from high altitude. And he ended up becoming America's first aviation fatality as a result of that crash. Which, by the way, made a lot of the public in the Bay Area wonder why it was that Montgomery was fooling around with heavier than air machines that were man killers. Right? We should go back to flying lighter than air aircraft because they don't kill people as much as these new devices do. So uh, Montgomery made another stronger glider, trained another aeronaut named Robert DeFalco with private flights at, at Sacramento that are described in our book. Uh, this is, again, Montgomery operating the windlass that's hoisting the glider aloft on his last flight, and that's him going up with the balloon. Um, so, unfortunately, of course, unfortunately, he made control flight possible at high altitudes, which was an amazing achievement here locally, made worldwide attention. Um, that was published in Scientific American. He published this now widely, uh, focused a lot of attention on him, but of course, you know, following that death, there was general skepticism about this whole thing and what Montgomery was doing in general. Um, he filed a patent on this, called his, he called it the aeroplane, 
It was filed in April of 1905. It was filed at almost exactly the same time as the Wright brothers filed their patent. And after a lot of research at the U.S. Patent Office, we've realized that it went exactly to the same patent examiner at the Patent Office, a guy named William Townsend, who had both the Wright brothers and the Montgomery patent on his lap, and approved both of them, because he felt that they both had independent mechanisms of wing warping. So he said, sure, both of these will work. Finally, the Patent Office understood that flying, flying heavier than air machines are possible, so sure, go for it. And uh, I'll show you pictures of those patents in just a second. There were other um, aeronauts, David Wilkie here, uh, trained in, in, in new, heavier, better than the, better than the previous designs, stronger designs, uh, tandem wing designs. And also, there were two brothers, the Lockheed brothers out in Chicago. This is actually the correct spelling of the name. They changed their name to Lockheed Aircraft, like the Lockheed we know today with the K. Uh, this was the original spelling name. They wanted to fool around with the Montgomery tandem wing design to put an engine on it to see if they could make it take off with the power. I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. So these are the first two patents. This is the Wright Brothers patent and the Montgomery patent. Uh, this was uh, patented in May 22nd, 1906. This is September of 1906. It was, was delayed because Montgomery had difficulty raising enough funds to actually pay the fees associated with the patent. Could have gotten it earlier. And also, a note that the Wright Brothers patent has no engines on it. They patented a glider. This is a glider. So the first patents in aviation that meant a lot in American history were gliders. Not, not uh, Because they wanted to patent this control system. It was all about the control system rather than the power plane. Here's that powered version in Chicago that was flown by the, the, the Lockheed brothers. Uh, this was underpowered, so it had just enough power to kind of skim along the ground and kind of jump a little bit, but not take off into the air. And the Lockheed brothers got onto other things and never kind of went back and added more thrust to this design. But of course, right when Montgomery was having such great success, um, yet another thing happened to him. And this was the great earthquake of 1906 that forever changed the Bay Area. Um, and, of course, curtailed a lot of what Montgomery was doing. He had to focus on raising money and helping the campus rebuild and rebuild his own life uh, rather than fuss around with model airplanes and, and aviation. Uh, he was the first to install a seismograph at Santa Clara College. Uh, he did a lot to help rebuild that campus after the, after the earthquake. Um, he also invented two patents. One was a, a rectifier for electric current and another one to keep electric motors in step with each other in the same uh, synchrony, in synchrony with it. And he made some money off of these patents. He felt that he had a, a, a substantial enough income at that time that it was time for him to set up a family, to start a family. Correct me if I'm wrong, Craig, he was about 50 years old at the time. Yeah. 51, 50, something like that. About 50, yeah. He married his sweetheart, Regina Cleary, because now is the time to start a family. Uh, but at that same time, after the earthquake, through the 1900s, 19, before 1910, there was public disdain in the aviation community for what the Wright brothers were doing. The Wright brothers were, now that they had their patent, they were suing people like Louis Blario and Louis Paulhan and Glenn Curtis and all the other aviators in America for patent infringement. Pay up. We've got the patent on aviation, you better pay us. And so those aviators were rapidly trying to de develop new control systems that would get around the Wright brothers' patent. So Glenn Curtis invented this aileron in the middle of the wing that was not wing warping at all, that had a new aileron system. And there were other people that were trying to invent anything they could to avoid these Wright brothers that were trying to monopolize aviation. And other people would come back and say, hey, there's this Montgomery guy in California that has a patent too. I wonder if we can operate freely under his patent. So people like Glenn Curtis would come to Montgomery and say, can you please let us operate underneath your patent so we can avoid these Wright brothers people? And Montgomery said, you know, I had enough of this. He didn't want to be involved in that. He just wanted to be involved in aviation and science. It wasn't his thing to be involved in patent lawsuits. So he said, you know what, let's, it's time to just invent a new control system that avoids the Wright Brothers patent. I'll patent it, I'll make it freely available, we'll add a motor to it, we'll do something completely new that no one else has ever done before. He called that the Evergreen, because it was developed and flown east of San Jose at Evergreen, California, on the foothills uh, of the chain that leads to Mission Peak. Uh, again, this was intended from the start to be motorized. Uh, he went back to that concept of a rail launch facility, but now instead of having a dolly be separate from the glider, he incorporated the dolly into the glider, as I'll show you the pictures of in just a second. But the really cool thing about this glider is that the entire tail assembly is fixed. There's no control at all on the tail. All of the control is in the wing. It's a pitcher on. So he went from winger on to pitcher on. This is 1911. Right? Incredible idea of doing all the control in a wing, just like a bird has a wing that can do pitch and roll. He's got it all in the wing. He had that curved elevator in the back. It's really not an elevator, it's just another lifting surface in the back. Um, and had a larger wing area than any of his previous designs. And he experimented with this with another gentleman named Joseph Vieira and his brother Richard uh, on these foothills 
uh, near Evergreen Valley College, which wasn't there at the time, and I'll show you some pictures of it. So here's, this is right where the observatory is, Montgomery Observatory is like right over here today. I just I stopped by there today to see it. Um, this is the Evergreen. You can see again, this is a fixed curved surface, this is a lifting surface, this is a fixed fin, there's no control here. You've got all the control in this big thing that you can rotate and you can also do pitch with. And here's the dolly now incorporated as four wheels into this bamboo longerons that, that are the fuselage. And you've got a nice seat instead of sitting on a 2 by 4 which is a good idea. Here's a picture looking back towards the hills. Uh, this is Montgomery Hill. This is the open space park that's there today. Uh, there's eucalyptus trees dotting the top of this, but it looks just much the same. Uh, this is a front view. And here's this rail launch facility. You can see the two rails going off the, down the hill. You set the glider up and have it tie down here. When you're ready to go, you release this and you start rolling and you get enough airspeed to, to fly off. You're in that last shot, you can also see the yoke control. Yes, right. So they first started out with a, a, a two control system, two sticks like this, uh, for alternating for roll and also for pitch together like this. It changed later to a yoke system where you move the whole yoke forward like you do in a cockpit today or a roll on the, on the top for aileron control. Ailerons is just wingerons, right? So inventing the yoke control. And also, uh, I've talked with a, a gentleman who worked a lot with this uh, glider uh, later on. Uh, the seat actually moves up and down. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know how that works in the mechanism, but the seat moves too. Here it is on the launch. And you glide down this valley. This is the valley towards Evergreen College, which is now taking up all of this. Uh, we're somewhere in the distance. Um, in this building. Uh, but you can see, you know, running down this railway and then flying down and gliding down. They did about 51 glides in this little valley, testing the control systems, specifically to put a power plant on the front of this glider and make it motorized. This is one that's an earlier picture, you can see the sticks for the control coming in for landing. But it was on the 52nd flight, unfortunately, that when Montgomery was flying the glider, uh, he encountered a thermal at very low altitude, very low speed. It was sufficient to lift his left wing up at low speed and in a way that he couldn't get out of and put him in a nose first pitch attitude like this into the ground. And he died on the field as a result of that crash, October 31st, 1911. Mm. And the doctor got lost on the way to the field, uh, which didn't help matters. Um, that glider was restored by the Smithsonian. First it was, uh, uh, went to Santa Clara College, Santa Clara College gave it to the Smithsonian for a purpose of restoration. Uh, this is the restoration, and that glider currently is on display at the San Diego Air and Space Museum on loan from the Smithsonian. And if I just get you to go back in your mind to that number three model glider, you can see that it looks an awful lot like that model glider design. It's almost the same thing. He just went back in his mind and said, that's a, that's a really cool design. I could put a motor on the front if I wanted to someday, and he was very, very close to doing that. He had actually ordered the motor already from Glenn Curtis, so it was very close to doing that, getting that done. He's buried here in Colma, California, at Regina Cleary's family plot in South San Francisco. There were people all around the world that experimented with Montgomery designs. This is a, a glider group in Switzerland. Uh, this is a, one of the first international glider competitions because the, land, the launching zone up here on the hill is in Switzerland and the landing site down here is in Italy. <laughs> so international glider. And they, they tried the Montgomery design against the Chinook glider and the Montgomery design flew better. He was hanging on for dear life over here. Uh, after Montgomery's death, however, the family, the heirs of the Montgomery estate, uh, sued both the U.S. federal government and the Wright Martin Aircraft Corporation for patent infringement. They felt that, especially during World War I, the federal government had used the Wright Brothers patent, but had not, they had neglected the Montgomery patent. And both, both systems used wing warping, and Montgomery was owed something for that. These two court cases went on for quite some time. This, was, this one was dropped against the Wright Martin, but this one went on more than 10 years. And as a part of these court cases, the federal government used witnesses like Orville Wright. Oh, and Orville Wright would come in in the testimony, uh, completely defacing anything that Montgomery ever did in aviation, merely hobbies, merely just an experimenter. No one ever used anything that Montgomery ever did, and left a record of basically trashing Montgomery in the court. The Montgomery heirs lost both of these cases. and. Historians, after these cases, went back to that record of what Orville Wright thought about Montgomery as being the truth. And if, if you look at the history, and Craig and I have, if you look at how Montgomery is portrayed in aviation in the literature, before and after this case, it's dramatic. You can see that he's a hero, a father of aviation in America, love with Dr. Chanute, right up to these cases. After that, 
poof, he's almost gone, written out of history, <coughs> specifically because of what Oral Wright was saying in those court cases. But in, in California, we've continued to recognize him, and we've recognized him in many ways. There was, there's a Montgomery Field uh, general aviation facility down in San Diego. It's one of the most popular general aviation facilities in America. That was dedicated in 1950, but there was actually another Montgomery Field up in San Francisco, if you're familiar with where Chrissy Field was, a lot around the bay there. There was a, uh, an airmail facility just east of Chrissy Field. It's now called Marina Green. If you're familiar with Marina, Marina Green, it's still here today. You can fly kites on Marina Green. That was actually called Montgomery Field back in the, in the 1920s. Uh, there was a movie again made by Columbia Pictures. There's an obelisk at Santa Clara College to where he did his flights in 1905. There's schools named after him. He's in the National Hall, Aviation Hall of Fame. Uh, I helped uh, with Craig and with a gentleman named Dick Huppertz get him into the U.S. Soaring Hall of Fame. Um, you know, lots of different, there's a Montgomery Medal that's now being offered for engineering by Santa Clara University. Lots of dedication and recognition of Montgomery here in California. And we're hoping that our book helps recognize in you know, greater geography than just our state. Um, I want to close by saying that I started the whole thing by saying that society felt that things were impossible. And of course it took someone like Montgomery to prove them wrong. Society always tells us what's impossible. It's continually telling us what's impossible. And it takes some pretty brave people to tell them that they're wrong. Uh, I have lots of heroes in aviation. One of my heroes is Robert Goddard, who helped uh, get American rocketry off the ground, literally. Um, he, said, he said, it's difficult to say what's impossible, for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And I just think that's exactly what Montgomery was feeling about aviation. Robert Goddard felt that we could get to the moon someday. And he never saw us get to the moon, unfortunately, but we did. Uh, because he kept thinking we could. So even when you're flying model gliders, try something new, try something different. Although you may not have people telling you it's impossible, you might find something that's pretty unique and different and might help other people in the future. So we've released this book. It came out last October. We went through two other publishers before we got to the right one. It took a long time and a lot of effort. Uh, it's available here today. It's available through Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Both of us are on Facebook. If you like us, you can like us. Uh, I like getting liked. And let's see. Uh, a lot of we went to a lot of different groups: uh, Smithsonian, uh, National Air and Space Museum, Santa Clara College, uh, Santa Clara University has a fantastic archives on Montgomery. I would in, I would encourage you to go use that archives. Fantastic. We went all around the world, all around America, not the world, all around America, uh, looking at different archives to write this book. Um, but my journey, uh, you know, this is me when I was about four. Uh, started with AMA thermal darts, you know, as a kid, rubber band power, getting used to what CG is and understanding where it is. And I still do this. I mean, I'm just, it's just a bigger scale now. But I'm, I'm one of you. I do the model glider thing first. And I feel like, you know, if Montgomery was around today, he'd be like SBSS member and he'd be doing 2.4 and he'd be at Vesalia flying his gliders just like we do. Because it's fun, right? Model gliders are fun. And he recognized that really early on. He's like one of the first model glider aficionados that America had to me. So, I do want to say before I end, not only did the story for Montgomery change because of that lawsuit, there was another unfortunate incident that happened in 1916 mm -hmm. that forever changed Montgomery's legacy too. So in 1916, San Diego uh, experienced an extreme drought. Um, the city was so stricken, they hired a rainmaker uh, by a guy named Charles Hatfield, who said he could make it rain. So he set up these huge vats of weird chemicals on the hillsides in the hope that he could make it rain, they paid him money. He said, if you, can, if you can make it rain, we'll pay you money. <laughs> and sure enough, it started to rain. And it started to rain more and more and more and more and more. And it wouldn't stop raining. It just kept raining. And soon the reservoirs were filling up, and soon the dams were breaking. There was so much water. And so this is right where the Fruitland Ranch was. Uh, there's a very big reservoir called Otai Lake up here that the dam broke. And all of that water came down in one big gush and ripped the whole Montgomery uh, Fruitland Ranch out into San Diego Bay, down to the foundations. The little fountain that I showed you, that concrete pond, survived. That was about one of the only things that survived. So anything we had of his early gliders, of his early notebooks, if he had them, all that stuff, is now sitting somewhere at the bottom of San Diego Bay, unfortunately. At least that's what we believe. We hope we can find them someday we're wrong, but that's what we believe. So I hope that explained that story to you. I'm happy to take any questions. I think it's great that Craig's here as well, and uh, open it up. Please, question uh, there. Gary, I'd yeah. like for you folks to know that the club, SBSS, did make a contribution 
to the Montgomery uh, Medal. Oh, oh, hey, great. Thank yeah, you. That's fun. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, Recall. very good. Appreciate that. Yes, please. Uh, I just wanted to notice if you went back to the uh, now invisible pictures. Yeah. Um, the uh, the air, the top down view of the glider launching off the hill. Yeah. I'll go back. Sure. Yeah. Way, 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 way back. No problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in the picture right before launch, you could actually see one more. Go back one more. No problem. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Okay, one more. Yeah. Just one more. No problem. <laughs> right before launch, you're yeah. talking about how flexible this there. wing is. Yes. See, the trailing edges are hanging way down. Yes, you watch sir. in. Go to the next one. Yeah, it's a different shape. You bet. Yeah. you bet. Now, go to the next one. Now, this is a really cool. Oh, sorry. I'm doing it one click at a time. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah. This one? No, uh, top down, the aerial view. I'm sorry. This there one. we go. Yeah. Look look at the wing, and you can actually Rotate. see him controlling yes, it. Yes, you can. Exactly. The There's left wing is, there is twist. is pushing down. You bet. And he's you actually bet. making right. a turn to the turn. And so there is one. There's one story on one of these flights where he was able to launch, turned right away after launch, went parallel to the ridge, and landed up on top on the ridge rather than in the valley. Below. Slope soaring. So there you he go. Was, he was trying to slope serve this thing. Yep. But you know, and also on the flight that Maloney made on several flights of Maloney, Maloney, Maloney would report back to Montgomery. You know, I ran through some big air pocket that lifted me up, and I didn't. I, I was flying all of a sudden, going up, and then I came back down again. And Montgomery recognized it by 1905 what thermals were. He understood what Maloney was going through. They never had circled in it. They never used it for lift. They didn't do it at the time, 10 minute duration for a spot landing. But uh, he could have recognized it and done that. He just never got to that point. But they were, they, were, they were actually recognizing what they were flying through as being funnels of lifting air. They describe it that way. Actually, Maloney did do his spot landing. He did. First, yeah, he did. He did. he did. he did. He did. He did. But not not the thermal duration contest. No. Right? Yeah. He missed out on that. I think this is the right. Oh, that was. I'll do that one. That's easier on the ice. Yeah. Any other questions? There was a mention of agriculture or the field in San Jose. Was that like the Center County part of? Yeah, the agricultural. The park. agricultural park uh, later became Henchette Park, and it's. Uh, near where the Alameda and Race Street intersect, it's a large oh, park. Okay. I think it would be great if um, there is some opportunity for this club to honor Montgomery with a field name or with something, or interacting with some of the Montgomery schools to get those kids interested in the <coughs> and In some end, there's got to be, I think, a great link here because you've got the greatest story because it all started right here. And you should, you should somehow leverage that through the media or through something to get this club to be bigger and better. Yeah. So, anyway. we'd love to do that. Yeah. That may be our end to the education system around here. That would be, yeah. that would be great. Great story. Great story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Get to pick up your book. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Great yeah. gift for Christmas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. At work, we're doing experiments with sandwiches. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
tourists come to this and they all the day like that. Like from 5 o'clock in the morning to 10.30 at night. And you know, you know, it's not like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not like that. Yeah, I mean, it's not like that. I opened the curtains and I just got posters of Alaska sunrise with all the really vivid colors and things. Like I always got in Photoshop. They're not. They're, they're not. It was like I opened up and I was like, holy. Where's my camera? I haven't got my glasses on yet, but where's my camera? It's that on there. Uh, the yeah, it, it has a without the detail. Yeah, it has a kind of familiar plant on the way. Yeah, oh yeah.